Hello, my name is Dr. Ominde, and in this lecture series, I'm going to discuss the anatomy of the upper GIT. So we'll focus on the esophagus and the stomach. And um, this PowerPoint is borrowed from SDU Lizeno. Yeah, so um, we'll go straight to discuss um, the objectives understand the origin, termination, course, relations, blood supply, lymphatic drainage, innervation, and applied aspects of the esophagus. Then we'll go ahead and discuss the position, relations, blood supply, lymphatic drainage, innervation, and applied aspects of the stomach. So the esophagus is a muscular intimate, it's five centimeters long, and it connects the pharynx, to the stomach so it's a continuation of the pharynx and terminates by connecting to, to the stomach usually <clears throat> the esophagus is flattened until posteriorly and the origin of the esophagus is at the neck usually continuation of the pharynx at the lower border of the cricoid cartilage and this occurs at the level of the six cervical vertebra so the lower border of cricoid cartilage the pharynx continues as the esophagus, and this is at the C6 vertebra. Then the esophagus um, will leave the neck into the thorax, so we see it in the superior mediastinum, then in the posterior mediastinum, and it leaves the thorax to the abdomen by piercing the diaphragm through the esophageal hiatus at the vertebral level T10 to enter the abdomen. Then in the abdomen, it terminates at T11 by opening its contents into the stomach. So this is the esophagus. It begins as a continuation of pharynx at lower border of cricoid cartilage at C6. Then in the neck, we see it later in the superior mediastinum, in the posterior mediastinum, pierces the diaphragm at T10 to enter the abdomen and then terminates at uh, uh, by connecting or emptying the contents to the stomach therefore um, terminating at T11 vertebral um, level. So what is the general direction of the esophagus? So usually the esophagus is vertically oriented. It's vertically oriented and it has two curvatures, two or three curvatures. So remember, it begins at the midline. Then later on, it inclines towards the left at the root of the neck. So at the root of the neck, it inclines towards the, the left and then goes back to the midline and again deviates towards the left at the lower portion of the posterior mediastinum. So it has two curvatures, slight curvatures towards the, the left. The esophagus has four constrictions. The first constriction is at the pharyngeoesophageal junction. That is the beginning of the esophagus. And this constriction is caused by the cricopharyngeus muscle that forms the cricopharyngeal sphincter. The other constriction of the esophagus is where it is crossed by the aortic arc. The third one is where it's crossed by the left bronchus. And the last one is at the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm at T10 vertebral level. So those are the four constrictions of the esophagus. The uppermost constriction is the most vulnerable part. So it's usually a very common site of perforation during endoscopic um, esophageal procedures. So it's a site of perforation. This, uh, at the level of the cricopharyngeus sphincter, it's the narrowest portion. Now, this during endoscopy, as you pass the endoscope through the mouth to enter the esophagus, the um, level of these constrictions of the esophagus can be measured from the upper incisor teeth. So 15 centimeters, as you pass the endoscope from the mouth and the endoscope goes deeper, 15 centimeters from the upper incisor, it is believed that that is the area of the uh, first constriction, the cricopharyngeal sphincter. So it's 15 centimeters from incisor, upper incisors. Then as you continue the endoscope downwards, when you're 25 centimeters from the superior incisor teeth, you get to where the arc of the aorta crosses anterior to the esophagus, giving the second constriction. Then the third constriction by the left main bronchus is at 27 centimeters from the upper incisors. And lastly, the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm is 4 centimeters from the um, anterior incisors. So the esophagus basically is the narrow portion, narrowest portion of the GIT.
apart from the appendix. So it's the narrowest portion of the GIT, and these are the landmarks of the um, constrictions from the upper incisor tip during endoscopy. So why do you need to know about these constrictions of the esophagus? Because they are um, areas where foreign bodies are commonly dis, uh, dislodged. So the most common site is usually at the thoracic inlet. And when you do a chest radiograph, this portion is usually midway between the clavicle. So that's the esophagus at the thoracic inlet midway between the clavicle. So it's the site of anatomical change from the skeletal muscle to the smooth muscle. Now the esophagus is divided into three thirds, three equal portions, okay? So you have three, so from the superior third is mainly skeletal muscle that forms its wall. The middle has um, skeletal and smooth muscle, and then the last third has smooth muscle. So where you have the change from skeletal to smooth muscle, that's the commonest site where foreign bodies get trapped. The cricopharyngeus muscle, or the sphincter, is at C6 vertebral level, where the esophagus is beginning um, as a condition of the pharynx. And at this level, this is where many foreign bodies are trapped. So above about 70% of blunt foreign bodies actually lodge at the cricopharyngeus sphincter. Then 15% get to the mid esophagus, where the aortic arc and the carina overlap the esophagus. And then another 15% are lodged at the lower esophageal sphincter. And this lower esophageal sphincter is at the gastroesophageal junction. So when you're looking at the histology of the esophagus, the lumen is usually rugged and it has mucosa made up of stratified squamous parakeratinized epithelium. So from the epithelium, you get to the lamina propria and, those, and the muscularis mucosa, and those three form the mucosa. From there, you get to the submucosa mainly, collagen and elastic fibers and neurovascular structures. Then before you get to the muscularis, which we have said the upper third is skeletal muscle, then the lower third is smooth muscle, and the middle third is mixed skeletal and smooth. Then on the outer surface, you have your, uh, your adventitia, which is mainly serosa. Now, the muscular layer, the muscular layer of the esophagus, the muscles are arranged as outer longitudinal and inner circular muscle fibers. Outer longitudinal and inner circle muscle fibers. Now, we have what we call limas um, dehiscent. Now, this is limas dehiscent. Now, remember the esophagus is a continuation of the pharynx, and the lowest um, muscle of the pharynx is the inferior constrictor muscle, and these muscles run obliquely. The inferior constrictor muscles run obliquely and the cricopharyngeus muscle fibers run transversely. So the triangular area between these two muscles, oblique fibers of inferior constrictor and the transverse fibers of cricopharyngeus muscle, it forms what you call limas dehiscence. So it's a weak point where Zenkas diverticulum occurs. So you can have herniation of the mucosa, esophageal mucosa at this area leading to what we call Zenkas diverticulum. So the esophagus has two sphincters. You have the upper esophageal sphincter, which is an anatomic sphincter at the origin of the esophagus. And this sphincter is formed by the cricopharyngeus muscle. So it is an area of elevated pressure located between the pharynx and the esophagus. The lower esophageal sphincter is more of a physiologic sphincter. It's not an anatomic sphincter. And it's found at the junction between the stomach and the esophagus. And it's usually localized at or below the diaphragmatic hernia, uh, di diaphragmatic hiatus, where the esophagus passes through the thoracic diaphragm. So, the esophagus we have said is a continuation of the pharynx and begins opposite C6 vertebra, and it passes through the esophageal opening of the diaphragm at T10 and joins the stomach at T11. So, what are the relations of the esophagus in the neck? So, anteriorly. You have the trachea, thyroid gland, and thoracic duct. You can see this is your esophagus here with the rugged lumen. So anterior to each, there is your trachea here and the um, thyroid gland. The isthmus of the thyroid is here. And then you can see the lobes of the thyroid gland. So anteriorly, you have trachea, thyroid gland, thoracic ducts. You also have the strap muscles. Then posteriorly, you have the vertebral column and longismus coli muscle. And laterally, you have the... Um, 
carotid sheath containing common carotid arteries, internal jugular veins, the lobes of the thyroid gland are also lateral to the esophagus. And remember the recurrent laryngeal nerve that usually causes in the tracheoesophageal groove, groove between the trachea and the esophagus. You have your recurrent laryngeal nerve. So those are the relations of the esophagus in the neck. Then in the superior mediastinum, anterior to the esophagus is the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, the trachea and the left subclavian artery. Posterior to each, to the esophagus, is the thoracic vertebra, and on both sides, right and left, you have the pleura and the lung, and on the left side, you have the thoracic duct. Then, in the posterior mediastinum, anterior to the esophagus, you have pericardium and the left atrium of the heart. Posterior to the esophagus, there is the thoracic duct, descending aorta, and the azygous vein, which are components of the um, uh, posterior mediastinum. Then to the right and left, you have the lungs and the pleura, and to the left, you also have the descending aorta. So the esophagus is mainly supplied by sympathetic nerves, and the vagus nerves provide parasympathetic. Arterial supply of the esophagus is by longitudinal anastomosis of veins, of arteries, which we'll discuss, and the venous drainage is by azygous and hemiazygous veins. The esophagus drains into the posterior mediastinal lymph nodes. So the longitudinal anastomosis of the esophagus is based on the part of the esophagus. So in the cervical region, the esophagus is supplied by superior and inferior thyroid arteries. Then in the thoracic region, that is um, in the cervical and superior mediastinal region, supplied by inferior thyroid and superior thyroid. Then in the inferior mediastinum, the esophagus is supplied by esophageal, pericardial, bronchial, and mediastinal and posterior intercostal arteries from the thoracic aorta. Then the last portion of the esophagus in the abdomen is supplied by left gastric artery from the celiac trunk. The venous drainage of the esophagus, the upper part drains into brachiocephalic vein, the middle part drains into the azygous vein through esophageal veins, then the lower third drains into left streak vein that takes blood to the portal, hepatic portal system. So the lower part of the esophagus is a site for portosystemic anastomosis. So we've said the cervical portion of the esophagus gets blood from superior and inferior thyroid arteries together with the superior mediastinal portion of the esophagus. The esophagus and the posterior mediastinum is supplied by branches from the um, thoracic aorta. So this include esophageal, bronchial, mediastinal, posterior intercostal, pericardial vessels. So all these supply the esophagus. Then in the abdominal region, you have left gastric from the celiac trunk and some branches of splenic artery can supply the esophagus posteriorly. So you have intrinsic veins of the esophagus. These veins are in the submucosa. Uh, uh, and on the distal end, they drain to the postal anastomosis. Then we have extrinsic veins, okay? These are extraesophageal veins, and these veins drain into inferior thyroid, azygous, hemiazygous veins, left gastric, and splenic veins. And these two take blood to the portal venous system, while the rest take to the vena cava system. So the venous supply is segmental, and you have um, dense submucosal plexus that drain to superior vena cover and the proximal and distal esophagus drain into the azygous system. But the distal portion where the left gastric vein drains into the portal vein, therefore the submucosal connections um, uh, are formed between the portal and the systemic. So the portal vena system and the vena cava system. Therefore, where you have this connection, the esophagus is capable of forming esophageal varices in portal hypertension. Remember, varices are just tortuous, dilated, uh, abnormally dilated veins, which are tortuous. So when the submucosal veins of the esophagus dilate in portal hypertension, when there is high pressure in the portal vein, you get these submucosal vessels of the esophagus dilating. So these varices are a source of major hemorrhage in cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is liver fibrosis. In liver fibrosis, there is high pressure in the portal venous system, therefore leading to esophageal varices because the esophagus is a site for portosystemic anastomosis. So the lymphatic drainage of the esophagus, the cervical portion drains into deep cervical nodes, posterior part drain into posterior mediastinal, while abdominal part drain into left gastric nodes. The upper part of the esophagus is innervated by recurrent laryngeal, while the lower part is by vagus. So vagus provides parasympathetic innervation 
which are secretal motor and give peristalsis. Then sympathetic are from cervical and thoracic sympathetic chain. Then we have the Auerbachs and Meissner's, 